So I'm just going to go through really the commissioning landscape and what the opportunity there is for us. Kind of a, a, a view of a definition of how to reach patients and then look at components of effective commissioning model to, to deal with that and then look at what, what the opportunities are quite quickly. Okay. So really if you look at the new commissioning landscape, we've got opportunities for integrated commissioning, health and wellbeing boards, really focus on local requirements, local public health as well as um, national activities and bringing in other partnerships so that you know in terms of the framework it's all there. But sometimes finding hard to reach patients is like a needle in a haystack. For me it's very contextual, it really depends what you're trying to look for. Are you, you know, what, what sort of group are you trying to target? Is it around awareness of healthcare and how they should manage their long-term conditions more effectively? Is it about outreach because of de dep deprivation? Is it about cultural differences, not understanding you know, how best to, best to manage certain diseases? Or is it about stages of development like in teenage pregnancies? That means it requires commissioners to understand their, their local health and care constituent because the only way you can reach to those groups is actually understanding what you've got and then really identifying priorities because commissioning is all about identifying priorities and then trying to put in plans, put in place plans to deal with that. For me there are a number of key questions in order to do that commissioning plan is understanding where the variation or inequalities actually occur and then identifying what programs, how do we justify what programs would make the most difference and then what are those priority groups? Because they're going to be quite different. You know, if you look at the context, they're going to be very different groups. And then what's the tipping point? You know, what's, what's the thing that's going to make the difference for that, those groups in order to make the behavioral changes that you're looking for? So almost a, more of a system thinking um, way of planning for, for those patients. We are asking for a leap of faith. It's a change in culture and understanding. So that actually identifying the tipping point requires us to understand the context for the change and really do a bit of analysis on the root causes for the change. Of, or are we just looking at symptoms? It's very easy for, for us to collect symptoms of what's happening in the healthcare without actually analyzing the root causes. Then really deep down looking at what the incentives and disincentives are and how could these manifest to becoming a positive cycle? So, you know, in Seng, Peter Senge's work, we're looking at possible positive reinforcements of certain behaviors, but also understanding what could be a disincentive and not creating the schemes so that we're actually increasing the disincentives rather than incentives. So that's the development side of commissioning. I'm gonna talk about now, how do you find it? <laughs> how do you find in the, in the mass of data that we have and what type of analysis should we be doing? I think there's a, we don't do enough of in the NHS is the initial analysis. Some of the base case work that identifies variation inequalities, really detailed segmentation into what, what population are we looking at? Where are the independencies between those populations in terms of how they access healthcare? And what is the case for change? And actually stepping back and thinking about what are the things I don't know, what assumptions am I making about this patient group that actually I should be testing. Because we don't probably engage a lot with these people uh, and therefore we might have our own prejudices that we're bringing to the table, which makes it even more difficult for us to engage. And then I would actually advocate for a very much hypothesis driven insights. Do some what if scenarios what population would I need to impact for a change to be measurable? Because at the end of the day, if we are going to invest and divert program budgeting or program budgets into activity, we have to know what we're going to measure and what impact we're going to do. So little pilots that might be very good in, in isolation, what would be the scale of that change in order to, have to be measurable and, and therefore justify the investment that we're putting in? And how could I test the positive and negative points for reinforcement cycles? So there's a lot of stuff there, which actually means, if you think about it, we've got to be much more structured in how we drive these programs. 
you know, at the bottom is really making sure, some of the things that Beverly was talking about, making sure we've got an in interoperable infrastructure so we can actually collect the data. We need to think about when we create the data um, linkages, what's the architecture that we're looking at, making sure that we can actually drive the insights and then really get more skilled at analysis and modeling because we're not very skilled at that in the NHS. We're very good at making very broad brush assumptions, but not insightful analysis and modeling where we actually test out different hypotheses. And in order to do that, we actually need a, a breadth of people asking the key questions, because the key questions are not going to be the ones that hit you straight away. They've got to be questions that you have to delve into a number of layers in order to understand that system approach. We, we're building within the NHS a data architecture that talks about accountability, choice, efficiency, outcomes, patient experience, continuous improvement, none of which you could say, actually, it's the wrong thing to do. When you start looking for hard to reach populations, the information will be disparate. It won't be nicely joined up. It won't be truly available. And therefore, we need to ask different questions and what are the data sources that we're missing you know if I'm a patient that doesn't engage I don't have a choice I don't know I don't actually know that I have a choice you know if it's around efficiency and joined up thinking I'm likely to be accessing my points of care directly at A&E or walking centers rather than a GP the pathways would need to be different we'll be hitting different components of pathways that probably not data that we normally collect. We may have to collect different sets of data in order to drive some of these things. And how do we make sure we have experience and as part of the design? So if we are going to go up, create these services, we need to engage and design it with their lens, if you like, with, with the way that they want to approach the service, rather than what we think is the right thing to do. And then how do we capture that learning so that we're not always having to reinvent the wheel? Okay. This is what we always say in the NHS. We're going to create a number of you know, details, information. Then we're going to consult with patients. And then we're going to involve them. We might collaborate. And then we're going to empower them. Actually, it's quite one way. You know, we are the knowledge base, if you like. We are telling them what they were going to do. Maybe if we did two-way, and then that might change the outcomes. It might change the program. Wouldn't that be great? Rather than us thinking that we know all the answers, wouldn't it be great if we actually set out to engage first before we design the service or the change? I'm just going to finish on this thought. There are huge opportunities for commissioning. I think we need to build in more systems thinking in the design of schemes. We need to be clear about the context rather than what we think are stereotypes. Start small with some initial analysis. Understand what we don't know. That will actually then help us to develop and test the hypotheses and then really start understanding what the tipping point would be if we are to create the changes we're looking for. And <laughs> just leaving you with a thought, if minds are like parachutes, we have to be open. And maybe we're the ones that are hard to engage with. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully the presentation's going to change in a second. It's very noisy in here, isn't it? Um, <laughs> Just wait for my slides to appear. Oh, hang on. There we go. Right. Way down here. That one. That one. That's all right. No, that's yours. That was all the open. Is this the one? Or have we clicked off no, it now? No, it's not that one. That, that, that one there. So, uh, start off by agreeing with Ming about the 
myth of hard to reach, as you're finishing off, setting me up very nicely there. Um, I'd like to start off with a couple of quotes. The first one from Margaret Thatcher in an interview she gave to Woman's Own magazine uh, in 1987. Uh, there is no such thing as society. Um, interestingly, this is entirely in agreement with uh, a gentleman who was around uh, some time before uh, Margaret Thatcher was around, Karl Marx. And this is from the Grundrisse, his economic notebooks, where he makes a similar point that there is no such thing as society because what it tends to do is homogenize and group people together who are in fact not a group in the first place. I think this is one of the problems when people start talking about hard to reach, there's a set of assumptions about people. I'm hard to reach. Before I got into this uh, meeting room today, I was uh, accosted by Roger Hymas from uh, Commissioning Support Services, who was uh, saying, you haven't replied to my emails recently. Uh, there are lots and lots of people who, are, if you look at them, are difficult to reach in particular ways. And if you start off from that premise, I think it's a very, very dangerous place to go. And I want to talk about how we tackle some of those things. Um, first, just a little, thing, uh, a little bit of detail about me. I worked with um, Humana on their commissioning support services for five years, and we worked with, I think, 47 different PCTs up and down the country on a variety of world-class commissioning projects, uh, consumer engagement, social marketing programs. Uh, I'm currently uh, chief brand officer at Nuffield Health. Uh, for those people who don't know Nuffield, uh, it's private uh, hospitals, gyms, uh, we've been going for over 50 years now. We are the largest provider of uh, employee well-being. So in 51% of the uh, FTSE 100, we have gyms in place. Uh, but critical to all of that is we're not just private hospitals. What we're trying to do is create a joined up model of healthcare that takes preventative care, which is the reason we have gyms rather than just hospitals. So we want to stop people ending up in hospitals. So my interest in some of the uh, preventative discussions here that have been taking place over here are very, very high indeed. Um, so there's no such thing as hard to reach. The point Ming was making about the context in which you start to look at people, I think is critical here. And what I'd like to look at is there are seven rules. So. This is it, the whole presentation in one slide, really. Working through this process, which is the process that we use to engage people, we use this to reach people in working men's clubs in Barnsley um, for a pedometer-based exercise program. Now, when we first walked into the program, we said we were from the NHS, we'd like to talk to people. They literally would refuse to talk to us uh, as they thought we were going to uh, talk to the Department of Work and Pensions about what they were doing. We're all part of the state. We don't want to get involved with it. So they were ostensibly a very hard to reach audience. We knew physically where they were. We could reach them. We could locate them. So the same with data. You can find people. But the key to these reaching these people was the first point on this, knowing the customer. So understanding the world in which they were inhabiting at that time. So they were very alienated from government organizations. Um, in, uh, they were very suspicious of uh, things. They were anti-activity. Remember, we're going in there to sell them a pedometer-based program we want them to get involved with and walking. Uh, they caught the taxi everywhere or the bus everywhere or mobility scooter. They weren't really involved in, in walking at all. Um, and they were very suspicious, generally. So. Our first piece of insight in getting to know them was understanding that a group of people coming up from London talking to them about why they should be on a pedometer-based program was a waste of time. We needed to recruit somebody from the local community, somebody from their age, somebody who they could relate to. Uh, if we framed our campaign in sort of images of people being fit and doing great sporting things, it completely alienated them. They didn't see themselves in that way. So we used humor. We had cartoons based around uh, why going to the gym to them was a, was a joke. We used beer mat campaign, first of all, before we even went in there to get them engaged writing captions. So it was a whole series of things that broke down. We looked at the culture in the working men's clubs, which revolved around competition. There's competition for darts leagues, for bowls leagues, for a whole variety of things. Uh, and we thought, okay, well, why don't we set up a walking league so that we take their existing culture of competition with other other clubs in the area, and we set them against each other on pedometer-based program. And this has started to get you know, significant engagement with that particular community. But until we knew them, and we knew how they thought and how they acted, they were 
hard to reach. Once we'd started to break down those barriers and understand them, it was very easy to get through them. And that's really to the sort of second point, getting the proposition right. If you understand them and if you can capture that insight, and this is perhaps where I, I might disagree slightly on the, the hypothetical uh, insight point, is um, I think what we look to is the insight to come out of the consumer experience and consumer knowledge, then the proposition that you're trying to get people engaged with can be directly related to that, that, that point. And that is, if you get that proposition right, and this is true in any piece of communication, the amount of work you put in prior to any activity taking place is probably inversely proportional. You, you must spend far more of your campaign time planning, getting the proposition right, getting the engagement right with people before any activity. And I've worked with a number of NHS organizations who get a proposition that they think is right, get it out into the market, and then wonder why people aren't engaging with it. The reason is because they haven't spent sufficient time in that first place. Meet me where I am now. There is no point uh, trying to engage people if you want them to come to you. So putting something up and saying, come to us. That's why we went out into the clubs and we talked to people in their environment. Same thing with smoking cessation services. We couldn't, uh, there was issues over getting people to attend particular smoking clinics. Not surprisingly, because they required two buses for people in the community and they weren't prepared to take two buses. Very simply, go to where the people were. So being able to change your intervention, but also your process of capturing insights to move to people. Get personal. I think it's very important to try and engage individuals in this process. And one of the points Ming was talking about, co-creation is absolutely critical to getting the program right and getting people involved in it. The more that you can actually involve people in working through what you're actually going to be doing before you do it, the uh, significant amount of cost you can drive out of the program and also increase the efficiency of it further on. Um, Communications is uh, a two-way process. It involves an exchange of information. And again, unfortunately, the problem that many campaigns to reach hard to reach groups fall down on is they still tend to be pushing information out there. Unless you have got a feedback loop in this, so you are starting a dialogue with people, so not a consultation where you put out a document and then somebody comments on it and then that's the end of it. What happens to the information they've given you? How do you tell them what the consequences of that were? Where can they see that the time they've invested in getting involved with you and feeding back the information is going to have some value to them? All of this, and again, and Ming, uh, again to agree with Ming, the, the measurement of what takes place here is absolutely critical. Um, and that comes back to getting the proposition right and your objectives right in the, in the start of the process. I think the final point is all activity to reach hard to reach groups, or any group, to be quite honest with you, because I think the, the, it, the purpose is, will wear out. So a campaign that works well now will wear out over time. So you have to start to think about using that feedback loop and getting the conversation with people to feed into uh, moving on your activity, moving on your comms, and moving on your engagement with them. And that's why the feedback loop is absolutely vital, because otherwise you'll do something, and even if it works really well, it will stop working well in a relatively short period of time. So you've got to build that process in. Finally, a great quote about rules. Um, Edison's right, you know, there's a set of rules, but actually how you use them and you know, how you engage with them is uh, very, very different. Right, capture, hopefully, we've got some time for some questions now. Yeah, great. Thank you very much both, and we've got a few minutes for some questions. So, who wants to kick off? Wave a hand. Are people struggling to engage particular groups of people where you are? Question here. C can we have the mic, please? Can you hear me? That's it. I work for Swale CCG in Health Inequalities, and one of the main things I'm doing is working with supposedly hard to reach groups. And I must admit, I agree with you. It's more about engagement than hard to reach groups. But one of the things for me is, whilst I might see the benefit in that, 
how do I then have that conversation with my colleagues who want a simpler, more easier way of dealing with people? They don't see why you should put the effort into that. So how would you take that and sell that to everybody else? Um, no, it's a very good question, actually. Um, you could point to them to a, a, a legacy of NHS communications that have been completely ineffective in reaching people over a very long period of time as a starting point for that. Um, better, I think, probably to find some good examples and case studies where actually it has been effective, but you take them through the process that they took to get to the final communication. I think particularly around some of the social marketing campaigns that have gone on, there is, a, I think, a good body of evidence now where you can go back and say, look, in order to achieve this result, it wasn't simply about having an idea and going out and doing it. For example, if you, there's the great, I think it was in Doncaster, the smoking cessation campaign kicked off there um, about the three week cough. So, you know, a very good point about that is you go out and you talk to the public and you get the public to say, go in and talk to your GP about, but unless you've done the work to understand that the GPs were saying, no, you don't get an x-ray at three weeks, go away and take some over-the-counter drugs and come back again. So unless you understood that in the first place and then gone out and talked to clinicians as well and lined the clinicians up, all of your campaign activity was going to fail. So I think it's really about you know, finding good examples to show people. Any other questions? Are people succeeding in engaging with hard to reach groups where you are? Any good examples? Let's come to this lady. Um, Eileen Pippa, I don't believe in hard to reach groups either. I do believe in hard to reach services. <laughs> and I think the starting point maybe is to analyze your service and see which groups at which point in their stage of condition or development you disadvantage them. So, so you turn it on its head. But the other, I think the other thing is, it's the perception of the different as a deficit system. And I think by the time GPs are qualified, it's too late, right? So I would suggest that there is some fairly hefty input into their training. Sorry to be a dinosaur. <laughs> I don't know. I, and I totally agree with you. That's kind of why I was saying, are we actually making things too difficult for, for patients to access? Mm -hmm. And I think actually it is incumbent on us as delivering those services in, in order to actually review our, how we manage our services. Uh, my name is Brighton. I'm a GP and also a CCG board member. Um, I would just want to take it a little bit uh, at a local level or at a GP level whereby you are trying to engage uh, certain groups. Um, I think for a GP who is sitting in an office, expecting people to come to see him, and also sending letters, numerous letters, reminding them to come and have something checked, for example, smears, for example, immunizations, for example, uh, blood pressure check. Uh, you are trying to get those people to come, you are writing letters, doing all those things. So looking at your list of things, this is fantastic. But the problem is putting this into practice, GPs on, in isolation won't be able to do that. But if we work in partnership, we can achieve this because there are people like your, your group who can actually help in trying to engage with these uh, communities and then referring them to the GP. Then that, that the, the two way can work. But as a GP, just writing letters sometimes we have noticed that it doesn't work. That's kind of why I started with a new commissioning system. The actual system set up so that it isn't down to a GP in the practice. It's actually about engagement in the wider sense and how the, the commissioning activity can actually tailor it to what the local you know, population needs. I think, I think that is a really important part of commissioning. Yeah. Uh, my name is Tim Benson from Vision Health Outcomes. I'm interested as to when you expect the barriers in terms of uh, can't use email, can't use texting, uh, the barriers to communicate, digital communication with the health service are going to be eliminated. <laughs> you should have asked that one to Beverly. <laughs> um, I, I really don't have an answer to that, but I, I think 
yeah, part of what they are, what Beverly's team is trying to do is to make that type of stuff easier. Um, I was reflecting last night actually when I was preparing for today that actually there are some preserve, perverse incentives we put in the system in, in certain things, GP contract being one of them, that actually has, has isolated them from their actual population. So not, not doing the home visits <coughs> much as much, not, you know, the 24 hours within an appointment actually has created some bad behaviors. And that's kind of why I was saying, when you do schemes, you have to look at the, the bad incentives as well as the good ones. And, uh, you know, we, we, we've just got the balance wrong, I think. Feeling dangerously close to the speaker there. Um, my name is Dr. Wright. I'm a GP in Manchester and also a service provider. Service provider on the uh, local health bus. One of the things I've recognised in actually taking a service to the community and then getting off the bus and trying to integrate with the community is is the difficulty that actually you can take the service to the people that you feel are hard to reach and realise that the problem isn't about getting the service in the right place. It's about getting the people to change and for the motivation to be there to engage and I think there's a real need for things to look beyond the current systems of work and recognize new systems to enable engagement. Uh, yeah. yeah I think that's absolutely right. Um, the, the, now back in my Nuffield Health um, uh, role um, we are increasingly look at the use of clinical psychologists and behavioral change in order to get people moved through the preventative care process and um, there's a fantastic uh, uh, government Paul Dolan report called Mindscape I think which is well worth looking at which lo looks at a, a process for working through behavioral change uh, in relation to what you're trying to do and I think unless you start to consider those behavioral change dynamics in doing something it is very difficult to, to, to do that you can get to them but the getting them you can lead a horse to water but getting it to drink is the needs behavioral change excellent you've done well you've survived to the end of the final breakout session there's now a plenary session uh, that you can go to uh, but thank you all for coming and let's say thank you in the normal way to Ian and Megan.